Good evening. Chag Sukkot Sameach. It's Wednesday, October 8th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. Four policemen were lightly injured in clashes that erupted on the Temple Mount this morning after masked rioters threw stones, iron rods, and firebombs at security forces deployed there. Some of the Palestinian protesters sprayed inflammable liquid at police before fleeing inside the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Five rioters were arrested. The violence erupted shortly after police opened the Mugrabi Gate to non-Muslims seeking to visit the Temple Mount compound. The Israeli police and its special patrol units responded to disturbances this morning on the Temple Mount by master Arabs who threw stones, petrol bombs, and iron bars at our police officers that were located at the Mugravin Gate in the old city. As a result, three police officers were injured, lightly treated at the scene, and uh, we've heightened security in and around the old city ahead of the Sukkot festival, which is beginning later on tonight. Our police units, undercover units, border police, and special patrol units will be in different areas to secure the thousands of people that will be visiting in Jerusalem. The northern border is quiet today, but on high alert after yesterday's bombing attack on an IDF force that wounded two soldiers and led to an Israeli artillery barrage in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah claimed responsibility for the attack, marking the first time since 2006 that they openly took credit for striking Israel. We get more from IBA's Ari O'Sullivan. Israel has maintained a strong deterrence against Hezbollah ever since the 33-day war in the summer of 2006. Until yesterday, two explosive devices were set off against an IDF foot patrol on Mount Dov. The bombs wounded two combat engineering corps troops, accompanying a Golani unit operating near the frontier inside Israeli territory. The soldiers were evacuated by helicopter to a hospital in Israel, and they were said to be suffering from shrapnel wounds, but were in good condition. Israel retaliated with an artillery barrage of about 30 shells at Hezbollah targets near the Shaba farms, and the area has remained quiet since. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told the cabinet yesterday that Israel has demonstrated that it will respond with force to any attempt to harm it on any front. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon called the incident a violation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1701, but was careful not to blame either side. Later, Al Manar Television read out a Hezbollah statement claiming responsibility for the attack and also stating it was to avenge the death of Ali Hassan Haidar, a Hezbollah sapper killed while dismantling a suspected Israeli spying device detected in September. This is the first time since 2006 that Hezbollah has taken responsibility for attacking Israeli forces, possibly signaling a change in their policy. While the border has been almost totally quiet since, Israel has never quit spying on Lebanon, either on the ground or from the air. The Shiite Hezbollah movement itself has been preoccupied with supporting Assad's government in its fight against Sunni rebels. The explosions came two days after the army opened fire on infiltrators in the same region, but also after a number of incidents that revealed continuous Israeli operations inside and over Lebanon, including the discovery of listening devices and the crashing of drones. Neither side is keen on seeing the border heat up. However, yesterday's attack is a reminder of just how volatile the frontier can be. Arie O'Sullivan for IBA News. The cabinet has approved a new state budget for 2015, following a marathon 10 hours of discussion on the issue that ended in the early hours of this morning. All the cabinet ministers voted in favor of the budget, with the exception of the environment minister, Amir Peretz of Hatnua, who voted against it, calling it a political budget and not a social one. The total budget stands at 328 billion shekels, and with debt repayment, will reach 428 billion shekels, including a 6 billion shekel increase in the defense budget. Unlike previous years, the budget does not introduce any new taxes. The proposed deficit for the budget will be 3.4 percent. Bank of Israel Governor Karnit Flu criticized the budget proposal, warning that the 3.4 percent deficit is incorrect and accused the government of transferring debt from 2005 to 2016. The budget will be submitted to the Knesset for final approval. In a maneuver expected to increase his control over the Likud party list, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu plans to move up the next party primaries to an earlier date and will start taking steps in this direction right after the holidays end. Netanyahu seeks to change the Likud party's constitution in an attempt to strengthen his standing within the movement by granting the party chairman the authority to set aside one in every ten seats in Likud's list to a star personally selected by the chairman. That clause is similar to one that was recently approved by Bayit Yudi chairman Naftali Bennett, who has authority to personally appoint one in every five people on the list. 
Netanyahu is not expected to face any challenge in the party primaries, but is reportedly moving it forward in the growing likelihood of general elections taking place within the next year. An Israeli man was killed this afternoon when a bomb exploded in his car in Netanyahu in what police are describing as an attempted underworld assassination. The car burst into flames, trapping the man inside, who was eventually pulled out of the wreckage by emergency crews. Police said a second passenger who fled the scene was the likely target of the bombing and are launching an investigation. This is not the first time that underworld kingpins attempt to settle accounts in civilian areas, putting innocent civilians at risk. Turning to Turkey, where more than 14 people have been killed and dozens injured in violent clashes between Kurdish protesters and police that resumed across the country today after erupting yesterday. The protesters demanding the Turkish government do more to protect the Syrian Kurdish border town Kobani that has been partially seized by Islamic State fighters. The town is a short distance from the Turkish border. The violence erupted yesterday, occurring in eastern and southeastern Turkish provinces, as well as in Ankara and Istanbul. Police reportedly fired live ammunition at protesters and used tear gas and water cannons to disperse them. ISIS launched an offensive last month, capturing a number of villages surrounding Kobani from Kurdish fighters known as the YPG. Turkish government officials said it opposes supporting Kurdish armed groups affiliated with the PKK, an offshoot of the Democratic Union Party, who are fighting ISIS in the Kobani region. The PKK has been officially declared a terrorist organization by Turkey, as well as the United States and European Union. This morning, U.S.-led coalition fighter jets bombed ISIS positions in the Syrian Kurdish border town of Kobani, and Turkey deployed tanks on its border, preparing to repel any attempts by ISIS to enter its territory. ISIS has seized control of most of the town, setting off fears they may massacre Kurdish civilians who remain there. Yesterday, a United Nations envoy called on the international community to act immediately to prevent the Islamic State from seizing control of Kobani. While the Kurdish fighters are courageously attempting to push back ISIS, they are ill-equipped and no match for ISIS, who has tanks and mortars. The world has seen with its own eyes the images of what happens when a city in Syria or in Iraq is overtaken by the terrorist group called ISIS or Daesh. Massacres, humanitarian tragedies, rapes, horrific violence. The city of Kobani, on the northern border of Syria, close to Turkey, has been under siege now for three weeks. There were 400,000 inhabitants. They've been defending themselves, the old Kurds. They've been defending themselves with great courage. But they are now very close to not being able to do so. They are fighting with normal weapons, whereas the ISIS has got tanks and mortars. The international community needs to defend them. The international community cannot sustain another city falling under ISIS. Veteran diplomat Joram Ettinger and Wall Street Journal columnist Amut Asael told IBS Margot Dudkevich coalition airstrikes against ISIS will not defeat the terror group. Eventually, it will require boots on the ground to crush the Islamic State fighters. We just learned in Gaza that uh, the best of the American Air Force power, F-16, F-15, flown by very qualified Israeli pilots, could not take care of uh, terrorist bases in Gaza, and certainly not of the tunnels in uh, Gaza. It was only the Israeli ground forces which was a game changer in the war against Palestinian terrorism in Gaza. It was the same ground forces which was the game changer in the Israel's battle against Palestinian terrorism in Judea and Samaria in the year 2000, 2001, and 2002. Likewise, it applies to Iraq. For the U.S. to delude itself that it can rid Iraq, the region, Saudi Arabia, and itself by limiting uh, itself only to air force would only encourage the terrorists to expand beyond the Gulf and reach all the way to the mainland in the USA. The closer the U.S. fights with its ground forces, to the trenches of terrorists in the Gulf, 
the farther the terrorists would be from the mainland. The farther the U.S. ground forces will be from terrorist trenches in the Gulf, the closer the terrorists will come to New York, Washington, Chicago, Boston, and Los Angeles. Do you perceive ISIS as being a big threat? I mean, the it's world major, is... It's a, it's a major, it's major, major Islamic it. threat, which was largely, largely produced by Iranian takeover of the Shiite sections of uh, Iraq by almost complete takeover by Iran of Baghdad, which has, drove, has, has driven radical Sunni Muslim elements to support the ISIS uh, um, uh, attempt. But ISIS represents, again, a supremacist, jihadist, uh, Islamic terrorist, just like Iran. Iran does it from the Shiite Islamic point of view. ISIS does it from the Sunni point of view. None of them, none of them is willing to reconcile itself to peaceful coexistence with the so-called infidel Christian, infidel Jew, infidel Hindu, or infidel Buddhist. I don't believe any war can be fought of, uh, or decided uh, from the air alone. I know there have been exceptions, most notably uh, in Serbia uh, back uh, in the early 90s. Um, once again, I'm not sure that what decided that uh, war was, was the narrow military uh, action, which was indeed confined to, to aerial bombardments. Otherwise, generally speaking, um, wars are won on the ground. And this will certainly have to be the case uh, with ISIS, which is itself on the ground. And the ground at stake is vast. And the army um, located there is not small. It's not huge, uh, but tens of thousands of soldiers uh, cannot be um, made to surrender uh, from the air, especially when they are as fanatical as the whole world has learned that ISIS is. Having said this, this does not mean that action on the ground needs to be immediate. It does not mean that it needs to involve <coughs> uh, external powers. Uh, there are plenty of regional powers who have uh, reason to uh, engage in this battle in due course. And I think that everybody is waiting, first of all, to see uh, the aerial campaign that has only just begun uh, mature. And that can take even uh, a year, two or three uh, before uh, it is followed with some action on the ground by players whose identity I cannot predict. They might end up being uh, Saudi, they might end up being Turks, they might end up being Kurds, or uh, a combination of these, Syrians, who knows? ISIS is surrounded by enemies, doesn't have one ally, and it is inhabiting a flatland, surrounded by mountains, not immediately, but on the whole, ranging from uh, southern Turkey to northern Jordan, and from uh, Iran in the east to uh, Lebanon's uh, Shiite enclave in the west. All these overlook ISIS and its cause, and somebody of these, or a combination of these, will ultimately be, uh, meet them down on the ground. Turning to Gaza, the Islamic State today claimed responsibility for the bombing of the French cultural center in Gaza City. The Israeli Ynet new website reported that a statement released by the terrorist group this morning described the bombing as a debut operation of the Islamic State in Gaza. Close to midnight last night, a series of explosions rocked the cultural center, setting off a fire. No casualties were reported but damage was caused to the structure. Officials in Gaza said they were investigating what caused the explosion. Syria revealed the location of four chemical weapons facilities it failed to mention before. Sigrid Kag, a special representative of the UN Security General, Secretary General, told the Security Council. In a closed-door session earlier this week, Kag said the recent revelations by the Syrian regime raises concern that the Syrian government has not been fully transparent concerning its chemical weapons program. Kag said three of the facilities are for research and development and one for production, but noted no new chemical agents have been associated with the four sites. Last year, a joint mission between the UN and the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons was tasked with destroying Syria's chemical weapons stockpile. Concern is growing for the well-being of two Israelis who went missing when their raft capsized in the Aparamic River in Peru. According to reports, eight Israelis set out for a rafting trip during which their vessel overturned. 
Six members of the team were rescued, while two, a young man and woman, remain unaccounted for. An Israeli rescue unit set out today for Peru to assist in the search for the missing Israelis. Their families were notified and are being updated. The week-long Jewish festival of Sukkot begins this evening. Hundreds gathered at local markets to purchase the four species used during holiday rituals, including a palm frond, or lulav, myrtle and willow branches, and the fragrant citrus fruit called an etrog. Great care is taken when purchasing the fruit and plants ahead of the festival. Leaves are inspected for freshness, and the etrog is examined under magnifying glasses for perfection. The biblical holiday commemorates God's protection of the Jewish people during their 40 years of wandering from Egypt to the Promised Land. Contemporary observance includes dining and often sleeping in temporary hut-like structures known as Sukkot. The holiday is also known as the Feast of the Tabernacles or Booths. The festival of Sukkot is a great time for family and friends to spend time together visiting each other's outdoor sukkah booths. As the nation prepares to welcome in the Sukkot holiday, IBA's Aaron Viner took to the streets of Jerusalem to ask residents and visitors who they would like to host in their sukkah. I don't know, maybe Abu Mazen, if he would, if he would like that. And why Abu Mazen? Why not? Maybe it will be a pleasant meeting. I would love to invite Pamela Geller. Pamela Geller? Why Pamela Geller? Uh, Pamela Geller is at the forefront worldwide of combating uh, Islamic terrorism. And I think she's a hero of humanity, a hero of the planet, and pretty much a hero of everyone. So, Pamela, I invite you. Well, as you told me, that it could be somebody who's living or not living, so I would have to say my 16-year-old daughter who passed away four years ago. My grandparents, who are no longer alive, and I would like to spend the Chag with them. Where were they from? England. And have you been in a sukkah with them before for the Chag? Uh, with two of them I have, and two of them I never got to, so it would be nice to be able to. That's nice. My two uh, grandchildren who are soldiers. Where are they serving? They're serving, uh, you know, you don't say where. <laughs> well, I hope they can come home and join you in your sukkah yes, this year. They are not for Yom Kippur, so maybe they will come for <laughs> sukkot. I would like to invite Theodore Herzl into my sukkah. Why Theodore? I would like to see his reaction to what the modern state of Israel has become. Who would you most enjoy to come to your sukkah this year? LeBron James. LeBron James, why? Because he's an awesome basketball player. And what would you talk to him about? Basketball. Oh, okay. <laughs> Guess that makes sense. How about you? My dad. Your dad? Is your dad going to be there? Yeah. And he's going to be your favorite guest? Yeah. Let's say Bibi Netanyahu. I'd like to invite him to our sukkah. And why? Um, because there's a lot we can learn from him and uh, get to a lot we can talk to him about. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Turning to arts and entertainment, and the 30th annual Haifa International Film Festival opens tomorrow and continues through the 18th of the month. The 10-day event is held every year during the Sukkot holiday and is expected to attract over a quarter of a million visitors. Over 200, 280 new films from around the world are being screened during the festival, including 70 Israeli productions. Features and documentaries from more than 40 countries are on the bill, with three main competitions as well. The festivities include outdoor events, open-air screenings, workshops, arts and crafts fairs, and street parties galore. So head to the north of the country over the Sukkot holiday, sit back and enjoy a film at the Haifa International Festival. And from the north of the country to the south, and the 15th annual Tamar Music Festival is back at the Masada and Gedi region. Five nights of concerts under the stars with some of Israel's biggest names taking to the stage, including world-renowned Balkan beatbox, Shlomo Artsy, Moshe Ben-Ari, Aviv Geffen, Ivri leader Ehud Banai, Shlomo Gronech and Mati Kaspi, Hadag Nachash, just to name a few. The festival celebrates Israeli music through special and unique musical combos in a scenic natural surroundings. Sunrise concerts are a special attraction on Mount Masada. Organizers say the desert stillness and magic transform the festival into a one-of-a-kind gathering. That's the Tamar Music Festival starting this coming Saturday.
Turning to the weather and a significant drop as temperatures is predicted tomorrow. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours. And that's all for this newscast. Please join us again at the same time tomorrow, 10 minutes after 5, when Ari O'Sullivan will be here to bring you the latest news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield, wishing you a Chag Sameach and Shalom from Jerusalem. <laughs>